and the legacy of Henry Opu Kahaia. And when you look at Henry Opu Kahaia, also known as Henry Opu Kaya, he was the face and faith that launched a ship to bring Christianity to Hawaii and his people. His story is one of the most remarkable in Christian history. Opu Kahaia was born in Kau in 1792 on Hawaii Island during a time when ancient lands were governed by ruling chiefs. And as a young boy, Opu Kahaia tragically witnessed the slaying of his parents before his own eyes. His infant brother was killed with a pahoa, a spear, while Opu Kahaia fled, carrying him to safety. Opu Kahaia was recaptured and became a slave to Dali'i, the ruling chief of the land. Later, he was to be rescued by his uncle, Akahuna, or priest. Opu Kahaia returned home to train in the priesthood. Saddened, brokenhearted, and now orphaned, Opu Kahaia would find solace on the shores of Kealikekua Bay near his home. One day, an American ship called the Triumph arrived. Although he spoke no English and had no resources, the kind Captain Caleb Britnall allowed Opu Kahaia to board the ship, much to his uncle's chagrin. Accompanying him was his dear friend Thomas Hopu and three other Hawaiian young men, Kanui, Humihume, and Honuli'i. Not knowing where or how far they would travel, Opu Kahaia courageously set sail to open seas and embraced with joyful anticipation the new adventures that lay ahead. They sailed to Alaska for seal skins and then to China to discharge them. They then traveled around the Cape of Good Hope and arrived in New England in 1809, having sailed from the islands to New Haven. There, Edwin Dwight, a Yale student, later a congregational minister, discovered Opu Kahaia sitting on the college steps, weeping, because as he said, no one gives me learning. Dwight and other Yale students began to tutor him, and Yale president, Dr. Timothy Dwight, an outstanding congregational minister. They took him into his home. Students from Ann Overy Seminary and people of the New England churches befriended the orphan boy. Under their tutelage, in a single decade, Opu Kahaia went from illiteracy to eloquence and instructions in speech and writing. Learning to read and write, Opu Kahaia became convinced of a need for a savior and ultimately had a miraculous conversion into the Christian faith. Torn by years of agonizing sorrow, the good news of Christianity filled him with hope and peace and aloha, the love of God. At last he found what he had longed for and it radiated upon others. Opu Kahaia became the first Hawaiian convert to Christianity. He studied hard and longed to have his newfound faith to be shared with his people back in the islands. He translated the book of Genesis into his native tongue while learning new languages of Hebrew and Greek. He spoke eloquently, and the New Englanders marveled at this spiritually transformed man. Determined to go back to Hawaii to carry the gospel to his own people, Opu Kahaia was preparing himself at the Foreign Mission School in Cornwall, Connecticut, when on February 17, 1818, at the age of 26, Henry Opu Kahaia was gone. Uahala, dying peacefully, ready to meet his Lord, a victim of typhus fever, never to return to his beloved Aina Maule, his native lands. After his death, his early friend, Edwin Dwight, published the Young Islanders memoirs in the form of a brief biography. The little book aroused the interest of New Englanders that the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the ABCFM, chartered a ship and engaged a pioneer company to go to Hawaii as a field for missionary work. Two ministers, two teachers, a doctor, a printer, a farmer and their wives, plus five children, and the four Hawaiian youths that, who had accompanied Opukaya boarded the Thaddeus when he left Boston on October 23rd, 1819. They arrived off the coast of Kauai High in 1820, then settled in Kailua Bay on March 30th, 1820. With permission granted by Queen Kaahumanu, Kuhinanui, the missionaries begin to build schools and churches, sharing God's word with the Ali, the rulers, and the Hawaiian people. The impact of the Christian faith was monumental and, a, and kingdom was transformed. 
Three decades later, approximately 90% of the Native Hawaiians had accepted their new faith. Today, in, Ju in July 1993, Opukaia's final remains came home. At Kahikolo Congregational Church, you will find embraced his final resting place overlooking the calm waters of Kealakekua Bay. Opukahaia had found the true peace in Keakua, God. At this time, we continue with Kahuran Fujiyoshi. Aloha everyone. My part in this presentation is the section on Komo Iloko Okaloi, Step into the Tarot Patch, and Hemo Ina Kanu Kalo Kahiko, Remove the Old Plantings of Tarot. I knew about tarot patches. My father's good friend in Hanale on Kauai was Charlie Lau, who owned a tarot patch on the left side just after crossing that historical iron bridge in Hanale. However, the first time I stepped physically into the Loi was in Waipio Valley with a Hawaiian friend explaining the protocol about entering the Loi and everything leading to harvesting the kalo. Come, step with us into the taro patch. The Declaration of Rights of the Hawaiian Kingdom begins with these words. God hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the earth in unity and blessedness. God has also bestowed certain rights alike on all men and all chiefs and all people of all lands. Why does the Kingdom Constitution of 1840 and even before that in the Declaration of Rights published in 1839 begin with the words from the Bible and of these words especially. In Acts chapter 17, verse 26, the Apostle Paul addresses the Athenians. From his speech to the intellectuals of the city, after seeing the altar with the inscription to the unknown God, Paul begins to explain to them who this unknown God is. Read and study this yourselves. Among the explanation is our verse, verse 26, and hath made of one blood all nations of men, for to dwell on all the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. Among others, I have just completed a study sponsored by Hawaii Pam on the book Unsettling Truths, the ongoing de de humanizing legacy of the doctrine of discovery, authored by Mark Charles, a Navajo Native American, and Soon Chan Ra, a Korean professor of theology now at Fuller Theological Seminary. We have sadly learned that the U.S. Constitution is a racist document. It does not give rights to the Native Americans, calling them savages, Neither does it give rights to blacks. Slaves were considered three-fifths of a human and does not even mention women. Thus, it gave rights only to white males who owned land. In the Hawaiian Constitution of 1840, rights are given to all. There is no distinction among ethnic groups with these words from scripture. Hath made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. Give praise where praise is due. Next slide, please. My next part is on the theology of the resolution. We could spend lots of time on this. However, to direct you to the best sources for this, let me name just three. Read this resolution well. Two, Reread the words of President Paul Sherry in his apology to the Native Hawaiians for the complicity of the church in the overthrow on January 17, 1893. And three, read the words found in the initial plan 
for redress of the Hawaii Conference of the United Church of Christ to Na Kanaka Maoli. You can read this resolution by yourselves. Please read especially the first two sections on the biblical and theological rationale and on the historical grounding. Next slide. I want to read, reread the words of Reverend Paul Sherry, President of the United Church of Christ, in his apology to the Native Hawaiians on January 17, 1993 at Kaumakapili Church. He said, we formally apologize to you for our denomination's historical complicities in the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893 by unduly identifying the ways of the rest with the ways of the Christ and thereby undervaluing the strengths of the mature society that was native Hawaii. We commit ourselves to help right the wrongs inflicted upon you. We promise appreciation of the traditions spirituality, and culture that are distinctively yours. We promise to receive the gifts you offer, and we commit ourselves to stand with you in your quest for justice and self-determination. May God guide us all into a new day of reconciliation in which justice is pursued and mercy received. The third material that provides sound theology for the passing of this re resolution is found in the initial plan for redress of the Hawaii Conference of the United Church of Christ to Na Kanaka Maoli. The decision for this plan for redress was made at the Ahapayaina in June 1993, called the Agreement by Consensus for HCUCC to take steps for a redress plan. Three years later, in 1996, the 16-page plan with Exhibit A was shared. For those of you who have never seen this document, please ask the HCUCC to send you a copy. There are two sections related to theology, a section on theological perspectives, beginning with scripture texts that are divided under headings of justice, redress, love and reconciliation. The second section related to theology is titled, The Relationship Between Justice and Reconciliation, taken from a stolen nation, Kanakamali sovereignty, a resolution of the National Council of Churches adopted by the General Board, November 11, 1993. In closing, I want to share something I learned from Richard and Lynette Paglina Wan. Through their training in Ho'oponopono, a Hawaiian process on making things right, they led us through the process of bringing everything up that caused the broken relationship. Only by bringing up everything, judging who was wrong, and then apologizing and forgiving, only then could everything be Oki, cut, never to be brought up again. In the situation of the world today, only when the injustices of slavery, colonizing, and overthrowing nations can be addressed, and the evil of white supremacy that provided justification for these acts can be raised one by one, acknowledged for the injustice that it was, only then can apology forgiveness, and finally, oki, be cut off, never to be brought up again. Any shortcut in the process using words like, let bygones be bygones, uh, or it was all in the past, cannot lead to reconciliation, at least the kind of reconciliation that God wants. Mahalo for allowing me to share my manao. Next is Kalania Kea Wilson. Aloha ahi ahi kako e ohi ike kalo, harvest the taro. Um, I'll be covering 1993 apology to 2021 new information. For the past 30 years, 
many scholars and researchers of our history um, through Hawaiian language and English sources has been able to uncover and recover the information that has been um, there all along for us to access um, today. Oh. So since then, the 1993 um, President Clinton apology, apologizing for the invasion of the sovereign Hawaiian nation on January 16, 1893, where they positioned themselves near Hawaiian government buildings and the Iolani Palace to intimidate Queen Lilio Kalani and her government. Since then, has that properly been addressed? Has this situation been properly um, ho'oponopono ua ho'oponopono ia? On December 18, 1893, in Congress, President Grover Cleveland's manifesto reporting to Congress on this day from his commissioner and investigator, James H. Blount, the findings was, and the reason for the title is President Grover Cleveland's address to Congress, which says, this military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. For the executor, president of the United States to proclaim an act of war upon another nation or country instantly transforms the territory, the environment, into a state of war. And this is one of the things we may have uh, missed in 1993 when we researched that apology, the first apology. Why don't we know this history? Because there was a um, effort to remove this history through mechanisms understood under international customary law as denationalization and Americanization, which leads to inculcation, indoctrination, and I believe most people understand the word brainwash. So it was called the Program for Patriotic Exercises in the Public School System Territory of Hawaii in 1906. So my grandmother was, um, you know, she was treated unfairly for only being able to speak Olelo. And because of these programs, she wasn't allowed to, to Olelo Hawaii um, at her school. So when you, what other situation has been similar um, to the situation in the Hawaiian kingdom. So we can look back at the military tribunal um, for Germany after World War II. And the word that would be similar from Germanization would be Americanization um, in the Hawaiian kingdom. So the plan endeavored to assimilate those territories politically, culturally, socially, and economically into the German Reich. But in our situation, that would be the American empire. The defendants endeavored to obliterate the former national character of these territories. So when our Hawaiian language was banned and our Hawaiian kupuna was um, reprimanded for speaking their olelo. The intention here was to obliterate the language, which would obliterate our history, which would obliterate our national character, our unified character as one.
This 15-year-old genius just shocked the entire world with his new invention. He figured out a way to give essentially free air applications of these proceedings. I can say that I have... The Hawaiian subjects, Hawaiian nationals, they're fervent about what they want. That's, there's, no, there's no questioning that. But on the flip side, there's also 100 years of training, you know? And an old guy in Miami told us, you know, about the elephant, you know, when the baby elephant is small, they chain him to the stick with a chain, a big, huge chain. And, and after years of trying to break that chain, he figures out that I can't do it. And when that big elephant, when the elephant gets big, they just tie a little rope on his leg and tie it to the stick. And, and the smallest, the smallest resistance will stop that elephant from trying. He can break it. It just takes one step like that. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, for us, that was, that's exactly how it is. It, all you got to do is take the step because that chain is just a rule. It's, and it's all in our minds, you know, so. I didn't hesitate. It was, for me, a no-brainer. I said, yes, I'll be there. And the first day of the proceedings, literally, as I'm, I'm an attorney, and for six years early in my career, I was a district court judge. I have always been a history buff, student of history, student of political science. But that first day at The Hague, the proceedings, literally took my breath away. I recognize that in over a century, a question of the Kingdom of Hawaii as a nation state in the family of nations was not an issue. And I was kind of like, wow, where, where are we? And what are the ramifications of these proceedings? I can say that I have not had one instance in court where there's been any opposition to either the factual, the legal or historical arguments that we made concerning the legal status of the Hawaiian Kingdom. The Hawaiian Kingdom as a nation state would continue to exist under a prolonged occupation by the United States. Um, Dr. Alfred M. Desaius sends this memorandum from the United Nations Human Rights Office of the High Commissioner to uh, Honorable Gary W. B. Chang and Honorable Jeanette H. Castanetti and members of the judi judiciary for the state of Hawaii. The National Lawyers Guild NLG calls for the United States to immediately comply with international humanitarian law and begin to administer the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom as the occupied state. The International Association of Democratic Lawyers, the IADL, fully supports the National Lawyers Guild's 2019 resolution that calls upon the United States of America to immediately to begin to comply with international humanitarian law in its prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian Islands together with the National Lawyers Guild. A kanuho ikahuli with anake Anake Pualani. Aloha nui in the makamaka amena hua hanao yeloko yesu. Greetings to you, our dear friends, <clears throat> and to our church ohana, brothers and sisters in Christ, who are here to receive and give freely of yourself in the service of yesu. My presentation is kanu ho ikahuli, replant the huli referring to the resolution process. I will begin with 
what is a resolution? AX resolution is a resolution of witness, which is basically an expression of the general synod concerning a moral, ethical, or religious matter confronting the church, the nation, etc. An expanded version of its definition is found in the UCC General Synod Standing Rules. First, a resolution may be submitted if you meet one of the following six sources. If you are a General Synod delegate or delegate elect with a written concurrence of at least 10 additional General Synod delegates or delegates elect from two or more conferences. Two, if you are a local church with a written concurrence of at least five other local churches of the United Church of Christ. Three, if you are an association. Four, if you are a conference. Five, if you are a covenanted, associated, or affiliated ministry or other body as defined in Article 6 of the Bylaws of the United Church of Christ, and number six, if you are the United Church of Christ Board. AHEC falls under number three, an association. This legitimizes AHEC's right to a submittal. For example, I'll give you an example. If Kona Lanakila Church wanted to submit a resolution and concurred with Helani, Kaua Ha'au, Haile, Laupahoehoe, and Haoli Kamanao churches, Konalana Kila would be able to submit a resolution. They would not have to go through the Hawaii Conference of United Church of Christ, neither would they have to go through their Mokupuni or even go through the Association of Hawaiian Evangelical Churches. That is because they would fall under number two, a local church with a written concurrence of at least five other local churches of the United Church of Christ. In reference to resolution steps, first of all, you need, we need to get a formal motion of approval from the association to submit a resolution. Then number two, we need to submit the resolution by October 31st, 2020. And number three, we need to submit a final resolution by January 2, 2021. After that time, the resolution would now be in the hands of the General Synod and no longer with the association to edit, amend, correct, or make changes to. I will now walk you through additional process transformations. First, on September 18, 2020, at AHEX AHA, a motion was made to submit a resolution to the General Synod. At that AHA, the committee was formed. It was crucial that the resolution committee followed and met guidelines to develop this resolution following the UCC General Synod standing rules. At the October 8, 2020 Ahaiki, an update of the resolution was shared. Also at the October 8 Ahaiki, a motion was approved to submit a pronouncement which would have to meet a deadline of October 21, 2020 date. After hours of deliberation, discussion and research, the committee decided not to submit a pronouncement. Through the guidance and assistance of the United Church of Christ Resolution Review Team via Kevin Peterson and David Anderson and Kalani Akia, who is our committee chairperson. In the wee hours of the night, the draft resolution was completed, sent, and confirmed to meet the October 31st, 2020 deadline. From now until January 2nd, 2021, again with the assistance and guidance of the UCC resolution, review team of Kevin Peterson and David Anderson, AX committee must ensure that the resolution is formatted correctly. It does not have polity conflicts. It has not been addressed by the past two general synods and that formatting or other minor errors are corrected. 
Keep in mind that the UCC subcommittee's team is not a gatekeeper on topic of resolutions, but played a very important role to assist our committee. Format and structure involve the body of the resolution, the title, summary, biblical and theological rationale, historical grounding, text of the motion and statement, like I said, involve the format and structure of our resolution. Our final draft was submitted and met to the January 2, 2021 deadline. The General Synod Resolution Team accepted to take it to the General Synod Business Committee. On February 20, 2021, at the Aha Halavai, the announcement of its approval by the General Synod Resolution Team was announced. On March 4, 2021, the United Church of Christ Board met and AHEX resolution was adopted as a resolution of witness and recommended to be sent to a committee of the Synod. The resolution is now in the hands of a committee of Synod. It belongs to General Synod. It is to be heard at the General Synod on July 17 at 7.30 p.m. via webinar. Should you be a delegate or a guest, you may find details on the General Synod website. Now that it is in the hands of the General Synod, AX Resolution Committee must provide a resource person to speak to it and answer questions to it during committee time, which the committee has chosen Kalani Akea for. We assure you that at each process taken, we, the committee, we're in conversation with the Association of Hawaiian Evangelical Churches Board. Finally, I end with Kanuho Ika Huli, replant your Huli. The provisions of Huli were shared with you to replant, to increase your knowledge, to produce a great harvest of understanding to this resolution. Mahalo nui no ko no hoana ike yavahi me koma ko ko mike. Thank you for your presence. At this time, we will return to Kalani Akel to continue. Oh, mahalo nui e ana ke mai wai pi o mai ka aina kaulana o na ali'i. Now, e ho'o ma kau kau i ke kalo e ai. Prepare the kalo to eat. Um, what framework do we use? Um, why do we use it? International uh, legal framework um, upon the Kue petitions with um, which Jocelyn will be showing a little bit later on in that letter that Queen Lili Uokalani drafted, it says international law. So we utilize international legal framework mainly through the Royal Commission of Inquiry. Oh. So the Royal Commission of Inquiry is combined is comprised of world renowned um, international legal experts. Uh, William Shabas, International uh, Crimes, uh, Matthew Craven, International Law, uh, Federico Lenzarini from Italy. Um, uh, international Human Rights, International Humanitarian Law, and Dr. Uh, Keanu Sai, um, International Law, um, the Hawaiian Kingdom. So you can simply um, click on the link of the International Royal Commission of Inquiry and you can download a copy of the Royal Commission of Inquiry that everyone here can access. Uh, moving along to our last section, e ai ike kalo, eat the kalo. So we stepped in the kalo, we, we cleaned out all the opala, we got to take out all the opala so we can uh, see clearly, we harvest did our kalo, our ai, and then and now for the last section, eat the kalo. Um, 
And we'd like to begin with a QA petition or the anti-annexation uh, petition work of reconciliation committee chair, uh, Jocelyn uh, Costa. Mahalo Kalania Kea. Next slide. So the Kue petition for me continues. Haloa feeds us. Kupuna leads us. Next. So what I, I took from the Bible was um, Ezekiel 37, 3 through 5. And it reads, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? I said, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, prophecy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath, enter you, and you will come to life. Next. The Queer Petition is a document that sits in the halls of the United States National Archives in Washington, D.C. Next. The petition represented the voices of the people of Hawaii and the love they had for their country. Next. They were so unified that it only took them less than three months to complete. It was not something they questioned or needed to become more informed about. They searched for the petition, willing and wanting to pledge their allegiance to their queen and country. Next. It was one of the last instructions by Her Royal Majesty Queen Lili'uokalani to take to Washington. Next. They completed the petition and brought it to Washington, D.C. They met with, as Her Majesty referred to, an Emakuli. He was an elderly American that served in the Senate, Senator Hoare. Next. After careful discussion and planning, Senator Hoare brought the petition to Congress and it was read on the floor. America could not gain enough votes to ratify the so-called Treaty of Annexation. Next. Today, a group of us, today a group of us bringing forward the petition enabling us to add our names to the petition comes to tie into this scripture. So this picture is a sample of what they were doing back in the day when they read that petition. Next. These are some of the pictures I'd like to um, give you a travel through our huaka'i as we took the petition from um, island to island. So how does this tie into the scripture? Let me tell you a story as I share these pictures with you. I carry the alphabetized Kue Petition database to Mauna Awakea when they, were, when they had just started to occupy. A makeshift tent with a soup kitchen and lots of time to kuka kuka was what I remember. There were lots of students, young Kanaka, men and women, ready to assert their rights. Next. When we placed the petition on the table, they asked us, what is that? Some only heard of the petition, others did not even know of it. I told them, these are the heroes of Hawaii that risked their lives placing their names on this monster petition. I told them it was their kupuna. As they searched and found their tutu, tears began to stream down their faces. I went on to tell them that these are the people who made it possible for all of us to now be in this space. As I watched each one, I realized the moment they found who they were looking for, they took in a deep breath. <sighs> Next. The kupuna bred life back into their dry bones. Bones that were intentionally kept from its true identity, experiencing an awakening at that very moment. No different as what we are about to realize in this moment of historical breath. We have been asleep from the truth for so long, we will need time to recover from trauma we did not even know we were in. And injustice continues, but we can be the ones to make history and reconcile unto our Lord 
by offering true reconciliation to a peaceful nation. With great humility the, and aloha, the Pu'e petition continues. Next, in closing, I would like to share with you my ohana. To your left is my tutu wahine, that is my, my grandmother. To your right is my father, who was a proud Marine. In the middle is the signature of my kupuna, line six. He was 10 years old. That photograph in the middle is the man that signed the petition. His name is Aka or Arthur Kauiho. So when people look at the Ku'e petition and think that it's just historical and so far away, if you look at that gentleman off to your right, that is his grandfather that signed the Ku'e petition. Find your kupuna, have the life bred back into your dry bones and be awakened. Mahalo. Aloha Kako, everyone. Um, up next will be Dr. David Popham. I'm not sure how I can make my slide go. Um, there. Minister Popham. And then after him will be Dr. Ronald Williams um, for 15 minutes sharing about his dissertation, Claiming Christianity. And then after Dr. Ronald Williams, um, we'll have Dr. Keanu Sai from the Royal Commission of Inquiry share about um, the title and interpretation of the resolution and humanitarian law. Mahalo, uh, Dr. Reverend David Popham. Mahalo Nui. Uh, thank you, uh, Kalani Akia, and thank you uh, to the resolution committee for the invitation to be a part of this important conversation. I start with the disclaimer because of those who are going to follow me. I am not a lawyer or a student of international law. I am a religious leader and so my comments will come from the perspective of faith as we have heard other people speak from the perspective of faith. However, I do wish to observe that both the resolution committee and the PUA Foundation and their work, uh, Ua Mao, Kea sovereignty endures, raises up similar legal themes and conclusions. The overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani was an illegal act of sedition against a sovereign state and therefore involves matters of international jurisprudence. Now, from the perspective of faith, my remarks will address the moral and covenantal aspects which are also calling for accountability of continuing colonial and white supremacist ideology at work in the structures of the Hawaii Conference. My focal point in particular will be white supremacy, as that is what I've been asked to speak about. From the perspective of faith, we learn that white supremacy is this idea of one group being superior than another group. And we ask from the perspective of faith, is this what God intends for humanity? The Anti-Defamation anti League understands there to be five components of white supremacy. Uh, one, white people should dominate people of other backgrounds especially where there is a mixing of those backgrounds. Two, white people should live by themselves in white-only communities or cultures or societies. Three, white culture is superior to all other cultures. Um, some of this is familiar coming out of the past four years that we have been under. Four, white people are genetically superior to other people. And five, as an ideology, white supremacy is singularly focused on the protection of whiteness as opposed to racism or bigotry in general, which often have the background of the individual 
practicing racism or bigotry as the focus of protections. The shorter definition and the one to take away from here is white supremacy is this fiendish belief that white people are inherently superior to others and therefore should control non-white people. If you are aware of the events leading up to the illegal overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, then you cannot help but to recognize the role of white supremacist ideology at work in the Committee of Safety and its supporters. Mm -hmm. Here are some excerpts from the February 1893 edition of The Friend as it reports on the illegal overthrow. This is verbatim, and I ask you that you pay attention to how ethnicity is used to establish who is superior and who is inferior. Quote, long suffering whites, end quote. Quote, the wise, determined, upright leaders and the honest, courageous, intelligent rank and file, end quote, in contrast to, quote, the rotten monarchy end quote. In referring to the native Hawaiian population, quote, no doubt the majority of them are now governed by their long existing jealousy of white ascendancy, end quote. Quote, the removal of the terrible incubus of palace influence with its debauching and heathenizing effect, end quote. Quote, we anticipate satisfaction among the natives and their cordial cooperation with the whites in public affairs, end quote. Those who read my most recent reflection in the May 2021 edition of The Friend will recognize the thinking patterns of picturing others as beast, savages, and contagion in these quotes all part of the ideology of racism, and particularly in the US of white supremacy. At this point, I need to put on my Sunday school teacher hat. We will return to the uh, issue of white supremacy, but first we need to take a short tour on the theme of supremacy in the Bible, because I think it weighs in this conversation as well. As people of faith, of course, we honor the Bible as a collection of sacred stories which have as their common theme, the faithfulness of God. And when we read the Bible, honestly, we find that embedded in these stories of God's fidelity is the human ideology of supremacy. And if we are very, very honest, we recognize that the biblical narrative of supremacy is masterfully hidden behind the concept of righteousness. Stay with me, we'll get through this. How does righteousness understood as a faithful life lived before God support notions of supremacy which raises one group up as worthy and puts the other group down as unworthy? Noah was considered righteous, and this made his family worthy of saving on the ark while all the other families perished in the flood. We can debate whether that was a good thing or not, but that's behind the narrative. Abraham was righteous, and this made his descendants worthy of colonizing Canaan and in the book of Joshua, committing genocide against the native peoples of the land who were deemed unworthy of it. I know that for some of you, this is a most uncomfortable Sunday school lesson, especially if you are unaccustomed to peering, peering behind the text and asking if there is a human ideology encapsulated within it. As it turns out, these attitudes were also prevalent among Israel's neighbors in the ancient Near East. The Hittites, the Sumerians, the Egyptians, uh, the Mesopotamians all had similar understandings of righteousness 
and embedded with that the superiority of their people and of their God as opposed to other people and their gods. It turns out that ancient Israel was not so different from their neighbors in this regard. My point is that good Christians, even the descendants of missionaries, are susceptible to the temptation of supremacy masquerading as righteousness. From the quotes of that February 1893 edition of The Friend, it is overly easy to see white supremacy hiding behind the notion of religious righteousness. Now for sure, the sacred stories which imbibe supremacy also alert us to the moral injury of wronging one another. In these situations of moral wrong, the scriptures are quite clear. When we become aware of the wrong we have done, we are to be remorseful, confess the wrong we've done by either commission or omission, and make reparations for that wrong. As Christians, we know this spiritual practice from the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus states, quote, so if you are offering your gift on the altar and there you remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled with your brother and then come and offer your gift. This teaching of Jesus, it's itself a summary of the reparation offering outlined in Leviticus 5, which notes that restitution is to be made to the one who was wronged. And you'll find that uh, Leviticus 5, verse 16. Some of you may be asking, hasn't the United Church of Christ and the Hawaii Conference United Church of Christ already done this with the apology and redress of the 1990s? There was a time of looking inward, and from that time came the apology, and even within further conversations, the commitment to reparations. Last year, in the documentary, A Witness to Aloha, produced by the Kauai Howell Church, I stated that no apology can make up for historical wounds like the illegal overthrow of Queen Liliokalani but it is an attempt to say to the indigenous Hawaiian population that wrongs were done. Later in my reflection in the May 2020 issue of The Friend dedicated to the themes of the bicentennial arrival of the first cohort of missionaries, I wrestled with the passage of Ezekiel 18, two through four, which is a piece of scripture addressing corporate guilt across multiple generations. I note here again what I noted there. We must ask in this time of bicentennial observance, what is my role in perpetuating or mitigating the legacy of overthrow and occupation? Part of our role, is the continued work of unmasking the vestiges of white supremacy through legal and moral recourse. As I ask you to peer behind the words of scripture and examine the motives there, I ask you to pay attention to the motive of addressing white supremacy which stand behind the text of the AHEC resolution and to be in support of the continued work that is yet to be done. Thank you. I believe uh, Dr. Williams is up next. Okay, aloha mai kako. Uh, Ovawa Ron, Ron Williams Jr. Koi no apiha. He malahini vau iki avahi o manoa o wako i ka moku o kona i ka moku puni o wahu. A me ka halepule. No laila, e ho o muka mo e ho. Uh, so my name is Ron Williams Jr. Uh, I'm a visitor to this place, to Hawaii and to your churches. Uh, so I wanted to start with my mo'okuau. I'll give you a really brief version. <clears throat> my dad is Ronald Williams Sr. He comes from Arkansas, a long line of farmers, fishermen, and hunters, um, the southern part of the United States. My mother is Janet Marie LaBounty. Her people come back from Montreal, 
Before that, France, Ireland, Wales, and uh, Scandinavia. Uh, I came to Hawaii in 1996 and had the incredible blessing to meet my first kumu, Akoni Akana, the friends of Moku'ula, who took me under his wing and started to teach me a little bit. Um, I went back to school at 35 years old uh, and became a freshman at UH Manoa. Uh, I, got, I was a full-time student for 12 years, got my BA in Hawaiian studies, my master's degree in Pacific Island studies, and my PhD in the history of Hawaii. So uh, I taught as a faculty member at the Kamakukuo Kalani Center for Hawaiian Studies for 10 years. Uh, and now I'm working at the State Archives and also working as an independent researcher and publisher. Excuse me. <coughs> Pardon me. So that's who I am. Uh, I was asked today to come here as in my role as a historian and talk about um, the role uh, that the mission played in Hawaiian history uh, and the, the overthrow. And it's a very close topic to, to my work over the last 20 years. My dissertation is titled uh, Claiming Christianity, the Struggle Over God and Nation in Hawaii. And I went into it 12 years ago with the intention of showing how awful the missionaries were and how colonizing Christianity was. And I kind of came out with almost the opposite impression. By actually doing the research, by going into the Hawaiian language records, by starting to um, give Hawaiians agency for their decisions and reading what they had to say about it, I came to understand a really incredible story. And that was that Hawaiians made Christianity their own, learned it, took it in, and actually used Christianity as their central tool to fight against the overthrow and against the annexation of Hawaii. So uh, in that learning, I came to a, a really important conclusion that I'll show you in my talk in just one minute. Um, and it came to be not, I don't want to say a defense of Hawaiian Christianity, but, but an understanding that to those kupuna in the 1880s and 90s, to be Christian was to be no less Hawaiian. Uh, and I came up with the term native Christian patriots. These were people who were devoted to God, the, the monotheistic God, and their nation uh, with no less enthusiasm for each one. So um, how we get there is important because these general master narratives we've always had about uh, Christianity and Hawaii and so forth that I used to be a proponent of. When you walk down the street and say missionary, people give you a bad look. Um, but I'm gonna explain those further to you and talk about some of the ways we get to 1893, okay? So let me start my PowerPoint, one second. Right there, okay, share. And then we're gonna go to the beginning right here. And I'm gonna open it up a little bit. Can you guys see that fine? I can't see any faces, so I can't really tell. Anybody? Anybody can uh, not, can give me a holler or a nod? Uh, Dr. Williams, could you uh, make that a little larger? Sure. How's that? I can even go. How's that? Better, better, thank you. That's what that's, yeah, that's my whole yeah. screen. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so let's start off here. This is a genealogy of the United Church of Christ in Hawaii. Yeah. So you see the starting out with the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, obviously. We go into the Sandwich Islands Mission, which was a mission to Hawaii, right? A very importantly understood Congregationalist and Presbyterian mission. Um, root of, uh, the gentleman who starts and, and directs the missions is very clear about the fact that you are missionaries, not pastors, right? You're going to have to serve as pastors for a while, but you're on a mission, not a, 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 a mission to start and run a church. Um, Hawaiian Association starts in 1823. Um, in 1854, we have a really important event, which is 1853, we have this declaration of, Christian, of Hawaii as a Christian nation. So the ABCFM, uh, tells the missionaries here, you've done your job, you've succeeded, you've brought the word of Christ to Hawaii, almost all Hawaiians have converted, so now you can come home. Uh, that was when they started a local organization, right? So you've got that the mission as missionaries, now you've got this local association of churches that are the descendant of that American Protestant mission, and that is called the Ahahui Wanaleo Ohawai. Very important point here. Most, almost all historians, almost all librarians and archivists and, and church folk refer to this as the Hawaiian Evangelical Association, which is not. Uh, in their constitution, which is Makolelo Hawaii in Hawaiian, there's one copy of it at the Bishop Museum. The constitution is written in Hawaiian and it clarifies the language of our association is Olelo Hawaii. Yeah? 
they put out an annual report every year. And in their bylaws, they talk about the, the production of that report. And they say, we produce a Hawaiian language report for the Aho Hui Wanaleo O Hawaii and a supplemental English report for the ABCFM. So if you start to understand that and you look back at the 100 year history that's been written about the mission and, un, and un, comprehend that every historian prior to the last 10 years has written histories of the, the mission here in Hawaii from those English language texts, which are different in content and context. Uh, for my dissertation, I went through both the Hawaiian and the English language materials. There's quite a bit of material that are in the Hawaiian language versions that didn't make it to the bosses in Boston um, and so forth. And so right with that first point, we have this understanding that we've gotten a very skewed voice on what was actually going on in Hawaii. There's a collection at Bishop Museum called the Judd Collection. It was a central part of my dissertation. It was given to the museum in 1920 by a Judd descendant. Uh, it was off limits to the public until 2006, until the last grandchild had passed away. Uh, I was one of the first people to get into the collection. There are hundreds and hundreds of letters, Makololova'i in Hawaiian, from the pastors of the churches around the islands to Albert Francis Judd, who was the president of the Papa Hawaii, the Hawaiian board. So Judd was the president of the churches in Hawaii, and all of these pastors are writing him, telling him what's going on in the churches. Also, all of this material had been elided from the earlier histories. So we have that 1854 creation of Ahahui Wanaleo o Hawaii. Um, in 1863, the Papa Hawaii is created. So this board of officers of that Ahahui Wanaleo o Hawaii. So what is that AEH? That is the native and foreign churches of that American Protestant mission. For example, in Oahu, there were 11 churches. And Reverend Hyde, who was uh, in charge, he was the principal of the uh, Kuhuna uh, Kula Kahunapule Okapakapika Akau, the North Pacific Missionary Institute. Reverend Hyde talks about in a letter that one of the problems with our association is, is our great fear of miscegeny and our not mixing of the races. And he talks about the fact that there are 10 native churches under the AEH in Honolulu or in, Hawa in Oahu and one Haole church, which, is, which becomes Central Union, right? He says, you look at the Catholics, and they're Hawaiian and Haole in the, in the service. You look at the Anglicans and they're both. You look at the Mormons and they're mostly native. Um, but the American Protestant churches remain separate. Uh, and that's gonna be a problem later. So in 1863, the Papa Hawaii is created, that board of, of officers. And the board of officers is not exclusively white throughout its history, but the voting officers is. And so you always have white control of that board of, a, of an association that is made up of 30 to 35,000 native Hawaiian Christians. Um, it's always been going to be run by that board in Oahu by, set by six to eight white men. Um, that's in 1863. 1863 is when sugar kicks off. Uh, the sons of the mission have started to get into property ownership, property management, business, and so forth. Um, and they don't want to go home. They like their position here in Hawaii. <clears throat> and they decide to, it, it's really the inflection point for the mission. They decide to change the mission. Now, again, I'm not a defender of Christianity. I'm not a Christian myself. Um, you, you know, we, someone might have even characterized me untruthfully as, as anti-Christian 10 years ago. Um, but what I came to understand through my reading and through the, my dissertation was that those early missionaries really did reflect that mission of bringing the gospel of Christ to Hawaii. And it's not only my opinion, that's the opinion of the Kanaka Oivi. You read again and again and again in the 1880s and 90s, Hawaiians stepping forward, including a, a man named William Abraham Kiha who was an incredible native Hawaiian pastor and theologian. He wrote a, a translation and his interpretation of Revelations that was published in Hawaiian. Um, but he writes the fact that he mahalos Binamu guys, Brigham guys for bringing the word of Christ, but their sons and grandsons have become apostates. Yeah, so Hawaiians see it, they know what's going on. They've turned the mission from one into bringing the word of God to one running the churches and running the, this country. Um, Rufus Anderson, who's in charge of the mission, he's the architect of the missions worldwide, he comes out to Hawaii in 1863 and castigates them and says, what are you doing? Uh, it's 1863, you've been here for 42 years and you've, 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 uh, you've um, made reverence, what's that called? <laughs> um, you've, you've, you've ordained four native pastors, yeah, in 40 years. He said, you aren't pastors, you're missionaries. Um, so he pushes them to change, but they're not going to. Um, they quickly move into this mode of a new mission, which is, well, Hawaiians are Christian, but they're not quite Christian enough, and they still need our leadership. 
So that's what we're going to talk about today. When we talked about, so this is this is the kumukuna kanavai, ke kumu kanavai, oka ahuhui wanaleo ohova ine. This is the constitution for that association of American Protestant missions. And again, critical to understand, this was a native Hawaiian institution, spoken in Hawaiian, everything done in Hawaiian, but run by six or eight white officers in Honolulu. Now, having said that, the churches I visited, you know, with the kupuna there today in Wananalua, Wananalua Church in Hana, um, Waine'e Church in, in Lahaina, churches across the archipelago, they, you know, they, their kupuna sent delegates in every year, but they made up their own decisions in their churches. These were local, these were congregationalist churches. So yes, the politics was declared in Honolulu, but the churches really were being run by Hawaiian. And that was something important to understand when I, when I started to understand the, the power that they had in those churches. So let's look at this. This is from my dissertation. It's an appendix that marks the oligarchic connections of some of the officers of the AEH and the HMCH, the Hawaiian Mission Children's Society. I don't wanna run through the whole thing here. I'll, I'll make it available, but it's, you know, I, I wanna move along time-wise, but we'll say Albert Francis Judd, right? He was the president of the Papa Hawaii. So he's in charge of all the, those churches, the EEA churches across the islands at the same time that he was chief justice of the Supreme Court in the provisional government. He's vice president of the HMCS and president and co-founder of the YMCA as he's concurrently chief justice of the Supreme Court of the Republic. So you see that government and ecclesiastical connection. In, the, in my dissertation, I show clearly how in the churches themselves, um, the congregations revolted against the provisional government. It took only days. Two days after the January 17th overthrow, Kaumakapili Church in downtown Honolulu held prayer fast meetings. The delegates, the, uh, the um, trustees uh, took, held prayer fast meetings at the church, praying for the restoration of the queen. Now, pastors were a mixed bag. Some of the pastors wanted to keep their jobs. Some of them were promoted to other jobs. And so they went along with the AEH and President Judd by preaching anti-monarchical and pro-annexation rhetoric in the pulpits. And in every single case, I have 13 case studies in my dissertation, in every single case, the native Hawaiian congregation rose up and kicked them out of the pulpits and kicked them out of the halikahu. And think about that. That's where you're talking about native congregations kicking out native pastors because they were anti the queen and pro annexation. It's not about race for native Hawaiian Christians. It's about God and nation for the Haole, for the past, for the, for the whites. It was about, it was all about race. So we have Judd there as the uh, president of the board and president of the Supreme court. Henry Waterhouse is vice president of the Papa Hawaii. The same time he's a member of the committee of the 13 that overthrew the Hawaiian government. Uh, Allerton, same thing, officer on the Hawaiian board, member of the committee of 13, William Richards Castle, president of the HMCS, member of the Committee of 13. Peter Cushman Jones, another president of the Hawaiian Board, executive counsel of the PG, Sanford Ballard Dole you know about, William W. Hall, and William Owen Smith. I really wanted to go through, and one of the critiques I got was that I, had, I put in too much evidence, but I really wanted to say, let's stop generalizing and say, well, missionaries overthrew the queen. Let's be specific. Now, the big specific break is that it wasn't missionaries, it was the sons of the mission. Uh, now, that's a term that they use themselves, so we can't disassociate them completely from the church, of course, but they weren't missionaries. They were the sons and the grandsons of the missionaries, um, but they were the head of the church at that time, and, and I've got lots and lots of evidence of specific acts they did. We won't talk about it all here today. This is the Bayonet Constitution of 1887 held by the Hawaii State Archives. Uh, this is in the Thurston Manuscript Collection. He donated all his materials to the State Archives. One thing is they weren't, they were very proud of what they did and they kept good records and they weren't really worried because we have all of those records at the State Archives. Um, this is the back of the Bayonet Constitution, Thurston's copy, and it says persons chiefly engaged in the drawing up of the Constitution. And you're going to see seven names there that were officers of the Ahuhui Wanaleo Ohova'i. Many of them Hawaiian kingdom subjects had taken an oath to the Hawaiian kingdom government and constitution. And so therefore were treasonous in this act against the nation they swore allegiance to. Um, Mr. Thurston, Mr. Dole, Mr. William Owen Smith, Reverend Olison, who was brought out to be the first principal at Kamehameha schools, uh, was one of the leaders of the com committee of 13. The Committee of 13, or, I'm sorry, the Bayonet Constitution came from a group called the Hawaiian League. In late 1885-86, the Treaty of Reciprocity that had first been passed between the Hawaii and the United States, which had only taken off tariffs on both sides, was coming to, was coming to an end. 
the United States wanted Pearl Harbor. They pushed that in the first treaty of reciprocity, but Hawaiians had said absolutely not. But America wanted Pearl Harbor and they threatened to end the treaty, which would drive down prices for sugar in Hawaii. And so they, the white businessmen couldn't let that happen. The king wasn't for it. So the only thing they had to do was take care of the king. So they started a secret white organization and Reverend or Mr. Thurston himself calls it a secret organization called the Hawaiian League that was, and we have their constitution and their membership book at the state archives. And they talk about swearing allegiance to this secret organization to promote white rule of Hawaii. So you already have this very clear understanding of motivation. They don't believe that native Hawaiians should be running their own country. So you have these seven men taking part in a coup, right? To, to draft a new constitution, force it on the king at will. There were two different plans for the constitution. There were basically the Dole faction and the Thurston faction in this group. Dole was a constitutional lawyer, a little more staid, a little more wanting to kind of follow the law. Uh, Thurston was more hot-headed, wanted to um, kill Kalakaua. So Thurston's idea was um, kill Kalakaua, take over the kingdom, declare a republic, and have it be led by whites. Dole said, no, let's force a constitution on him that will strip him of power. And that was what they finally went with. So that was the first act of the AEH Friends. Uh, my fellow doctor and earlier had mentioned the friend. The friend originally started out was run by Samuel Damon, and it was mostly in the 40s and 50s and 60s, a paper that talked about religion, that talked about ships coming in, that talked about, you know, weather and things like that. The first month following the overthrow, following the 1887 coup, a new editor became editor of the friend, and that was the Reverend Sereno E. Bishop. The Reverend Bishop, I don't use the word lightly, was a virulent racist. Um, probably the most so of, of, of his kind, um, wrote constantly and, pro and prolifically about how Hawaiians weren't fit to rule. This is the first issue that comes out after the 1887 constitution, and it has its main column as Anglo-Saxonizing machines. And it says, um, about in the middle here, it says, uh, Hawaii is quickly moving itself into a fine working Anglo-Saxonizing machine. Toward the end of the column, it says, for Native Hawaiians, their only good prospect is to fall in line with it earnestly, to study and diligently to practice all that is pure, just, true, lovely, and of good report in the thoughts and habits of the haole. So, um, uh, Serino is saying already at this point, um, we're taking over the country, your best road is to fall in line behind us. That's 1887. The Reverend Serino Bishop, um, in 1894 was hired by the provisional government. Um, they set up a meeting with him at the, at the Hawaiian hotel with the United Press International president. United Press and the AP are like they are today. They're the wire services, right? Um, newspapers can't have a paper in every city, a reporter in every city. So these independent reporters would put, call, would, would put stories on the wire and they'd be used by papers all over the country. Serena Bishop was hired as the UP correspondent for Honolulu in 1894 which meant all of the major news coming out of Hawaii to the world was being written by this Congregationalist minister who was a racist um, anti-monarchical uh, figure. He wrote 107 columns that I was able to trace down. Um, and he also was a little bit of an egotist. I found his book here that you'll see in the page, Letters by Kamehameha Sereno E. Bishop. He wrote column after column after column that appeared in newspapers across the East Coast of the United States in Washington, D.C., in New York, in the far south, that said Hawaiians are savages, they can't rule, they have no right to rule, and so forth. And he knew he shouldn't be writing these columns as a Congregationalist minister, so he wrote under a pseudonym, and he chose the name Kamehameha. Now, I don't have evidence of this. I feel very strongly that he took that name to say to Hawaiians, I'll use the most sacred name you have to tell you that you aren't fit to rule. Um, so all of these columns would sign off as Kamehameha. In 1902, Reverend Bishop wrote in to the Star in New York and said, I am Kamehameha, I'm the one who's been writing these letters and so forth. Um, the part that I think is interesting in, in an ecclesiastical sense, sense is that he wrote to his friend Gorham Gilman in New York about these letters. So eight years of writing horrific columns about uh, racist columns about Native Hawaiians. And Bishop says about the letters, quote, I do not reckon the Kamehameha letters as a work in which I shall particularly rejoice in the future life, although I hope they have done some good, some service in a good cause. 
So this Congregationalist minister is saying, I'm probably going to hell for this, but I hope we're going to take the nation. That shows you the switch that has been flipped since 1863 between the early mission and the late mission. The sons and grandsons of the mission have definitely become apostates to the mission. In 1901, uh, so after we have the supposed annexation in 1898, um, we have the Organic Acts created. The Organic Acts in Hawaii set up the laws for the territory. They were created by a commission of five men headed by Senator um, James Morgan. Uh, James Morgan, I'm sorry, John Tyler Morgan. John Tyler Morgan was also concurrently the second grandmaster of the Ku Klux Klan in Alabama. He was the most racist member of the US Congress. He had put forward federal bills to remove all blacks from America and send them back to Africa with federal funds. He proposed sending them to Hawaii. Um, and he also proposed uh, sending them to Nicaragua. Um, he was the man in charge of writing the laws for the organic acts that created the territory of Hawaii. Nonetheless, um, there was a sliver of democracy in 1901. For the first time since 1893, Hawaiians are going to vote. Now, the executive branch is appointed by the president of the United States, right, the governor. The judiciary is appointed by the governor. But the legislature is going to be voted on by the people of Hawaii, and Hawaiians dominate that vote. Now, Asians have been disenfranchised since 1887 in that bayonet constitution, even though they had the vote in the Hawaiian constitution of 1852. But so now it's going to be Hawaiians and Haole voting in that election, and Hawaiians dominate the 1901 election. And that first territorial legislature in 1901 is dominated by Ke'au Aukua Koa Homerula, which is the Hawaiian Home Rule Party. And they pass bill after bill after bill, mandating things like taking all the tax off, used, used off of growing taro, sending na poor Native Hawaiians abroad to education, the best education in the world, giving recompense, giving money to the Chinese who have lost their homes in the Chinatown fire, even though the Chinese didn't have the vote, it wouldn't help them politically. And they pass law after law after law, making schools bilingual once again. And every single law they pass is vetoed by Governor Dole. And they're one vote short of a three-fourths override. So that legislature, in the end, doesn't, quote, accomplish anything. And the historians that come to write about it later write about it as an awful legislature. See what happens when you let Hawaiians rule. And that's borne out in the cartoons of the day. This first clip I'm going to show you today comes from, um, where is it? This, yeah, this one. Oops. Comes from the Pacific Commercial Advertiser. This is their cartoon in 1901 of the first legislature led by native Hawaiians. And it's literally monkeys in a jungle swinging from the branches with Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book written underneath. Um, this paper was owned by William Richards Castle, who was of the mission and also of the government. Um, the Pacific Commercial Advertiser was bought by Thurston. And that cartoon, once the legislature had ended, published this cartoon. The circus leaves town, the Hawaiian Simeon Circus headed off to the woods. So we need to not be um, hesitant to use the word racism. We need not to be hesitant to understand the depth of racism that was used by the sons of the mission who were running the church to overthrow the Hawaiian kingdom and push back a hundred year history of one of the most progressive modern nations on earth to make it acceptable to the United States. The reason why Hawaii didn't go in as a state is because Americans didn't want to bring in 100,000 brown people into their country and make them citizens. So, and, and when the annexation treaty went to the United States, one of the first arguments, I wrote about collegiate debates in America. There was a debate at Georgetown versus Columbia, Harvard versus Yale, and the first collegiate debate on the West Coast of the United States, which was Stanford versus the UC schools. And in every single debate, they debated, should we annex Hawaii? And in every debate, the no side won. And they said, it's not right. How can you have a minority white of white people rule a, a majority of brown people? Why can't the majority rule? So the people here, the mission sons here needed to, to infantilize Hawaiians once again and make them. So that's where these cartoons come from. That's where that narrative comes from. Um, now, William DeWitt Alexander, another mission son who was part of the government, he was president of the Board of Education. He published this book in 1899 that the Board of Education asked to write. So he basically gave himself the job of writing a history of Hawaii. It's called A Brief History of the Hawaiian People. And I have a copy here in front of me, one of the original copies. It's a horrific book that talks about the evils of the reign of Kalakaua, debauchery by the Lili'u and the orgies she had at the palace and so forth. And the most egregious part in my mind comes in a, in a paragraph where he talks about, quote, infanticide 
Infanticide, uh, Dr. David Stannard has written a book um, disproving the myth of infanticide in Hawaii um, as, any, as any significant practice. But nonetheless, in 1899, William DeWitt Alexander writes this book where he says, quote, infanticide was fearfully prevalent and there were a few of the older women at the date, there were few of the older women at the date of the abolition of idolatry who had not been guilty of it. It was the opinion of those best informed that two thirds of all the children born were destroyed in infancy by their parents. They were generally buried alive in many cases in the same houses as the unnatural parents. The principal reason given for it was laziness, unwillingness to take the trouble of rearing children. So William DeWitt Alexander, missionary son said that two thirds of native Hawaiian children were buried alive in their front yards because Hawaiians were too lazy to raise kids. That book became the history textbook for all schools in the territory of Hawaii, public and private, for 40 years. So when we start to think about what Hawaiians thought of themselves and what was thought of them in the 1940s and 50s and 60s, we understand where that narrative came from. It came from this history book, among many things that were put out by the Sons of the Mission. Finishing up, um, I found this letter the other day that I thought was very interesting from the American Church Building Fund Commission. Um, to the queen after the overthrow, about 11 months after the overthrow. And this group says, Queen Lili Okalani, esteemed madam, please find enclosed article cut from the recorder, newspaper of this city, New York. It contains the important action taken at Washington on November 10th. I earnestly hope you may be restored to your throne. It seems to me that it must be peculiarly unjust for Christians to take your government from you when the very Christian religion taught your people sets forth love to one's neighbor as one of its primary directives. With great respect, Charles Howard Malcolm. He's the corresponding secretary of the American Church Building Fund Commission. So you have these Christians writing into the queen saying, I, I'm, I wanna, wanna distance myself from the work of those so-called Christians in Hawaii. We're gonna finish up with this quote from the queen um, who remained incredibly forgiving, incredibly devout. Um, she was heartbroken by her personal church, Kavaiaha'o turning their back on her. Um, the Sunday after the overthrow, Reverend Gulick from the pulpit of Central Union Church, which was across the street from her house, preached a sermon called The Evils of Monarchy and talked about the story of, of Esther and so forth and talked about a young, beautiful woman rising up to a throne and being evil and debauched. Um, so she was very hurt by this, but she did not give up her Christianity. She gave up her adherence to that religion. She was soon baptized in Anglican and throughout the rest of her life searched for uh, her spirituality in other places, but remained a staunch Christian. Um, she had moments of weakness, uh, including this one, which is her diary entry of February 5th, 1893. So two and a half weeks after the overthrow, she writes in her diary, Washington Place, Sunday, February 5th, 1893. It is a gloomy day and it rains, rains, rains. Do not feel like going to church, perhaps never more. I never saw, saw a more unchristian-like set as these missionaries and so uncharitable as to abuse me as they, in the manner they do from the pulpit. Is it godly? No. It makes one feel as if I would not like to do anything more for the churches, et cetera, et cetera. And I'm going to end on a passage from her in her book, Hawaii Story by Hawaii's Queen, where she calls on the United States and all other people to do the right thing. She says on the last page of her, of her book, Oh, honest Americans, as Christians, hear me from my downtrodden people. Their form of government is as dear to them as yours is precious to you. Quite as warmly as you love your country, so they love theirs. With all your godly, goodly possessions covering a territory so immense that there yet remains parts unexplored, possessing islands that, although near at hand, had to be neutral ground in time of war, do not covet the little vineyard of Nabus so far from your shores, lest the punishment of Ahab fall upon you, if not in your day, in that of your children. For be not deceived, God is not mocked. The people to whom your fathers told of the living God and taught to call father and whom the sons now seek to despoil and destroy are crying aloud to him in their time of trouble. And he will keep his promise and will listen to the voices of his Hawaiian children lamenting for their homes. It is for them that I would give the last drop of my blood. It is for them I would spend, nay am spending everything belonging to me. Will it be in vain? It is, Amer it is for the American people and their representatives in Congress to answer these questions. As they deal with me and my people kindly, generously, and justly, so may the great ruler of all nations deal with the grand and glorious nation of the United States of America. And I would say um, it's time for us to listen to their descendants also. Thank you very much.
Hello, I'm Mike Kako. Uh, my name is Dr. Keanu Sai. Uh, mahalo, Ron, and uh, mahalo for the AHEC for uh, inviting me. And I'm glad Ron was able to give some background from a historical standpoint. What I'll be doing is getting into the legal and political situation of Hawaii as it unfolded uh, really since 1887. Um, so my, my PhD is in political science, okay? Uh, I specialize in international relations and law. Uh, my doctoral research and my articles and publications focus on the continuity of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. Now, uh, let me go to share screen and uh, I'll be able to do a PowerPoint presentation. Then hopefully we have time for uh, questions. Okay, so I'll, what I'll be covering here is uh, state of war between the Hawaiian Kingdom and the United States. Now, when you hear that word state of war, it kind of, it, it's, it's a bit shocking, right? Well, I served 10 years in the Army. I was a field artillery officer as a captain. And we knew that there were two uh, 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 state of affairs just from a soldier standpoint. You got a time of peace. So if we're training in South Korea in what is called Team Spirit, the battle exercise, it relied on the status of forces agreement between the United States and South Korea. Oh, let's say as it broke out between the United States and Iraq, then that situation would turn into what is called the state of war from the state of peace. And the treaties that would be relied on are not treaties such as the status of forces agreement or, or economic treaties, but actually the Hague and Geneva conventions, which regulate warfare. Uh, what people don't realize is that what happened in 1893 is pretty much exactly what happened to Kuwait when Saddam Hussein Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait uh, in 1990, overthrew its government illegally, and purported to have annexed it, making it the 19th province of Iraq. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, when I was in the Army at that time, I was at Fort Sill, Oklahoma, officer's advance course as a captain going through um, training as a planning officer. And we were receiving live intel. And we knew, as, as, as grunts, that Saddam Hussein, even though he overthrew that government of Kuwait, which went into exile in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, that did not mean he overthrew the country of Kuwait. The country still exists. What we called it at that time was occupied Kuwait yeah, under Iraqi occupation. And that Iraq was supposed to have administered Kuwaiti law until they get a treaty. Of course, to, uh, or ending the occupation itself. Well, that didn't happen. And the job of the US military was to expel um, uh, Saddam Hussein and his forces out of Kuwaiti territory. Okay, So that purported annexation that Iraq did of Kuwait was of no consequence. Well, Hawaii, <laughs> we have that same history. Yeah? It's just a hundred years earlier. Well, what was the Hawaiian kingdom? Well, the Hawaiian kingdom was a recognized neutral state by treaty along with Belgium, Luxembourg and Switzerland. As a constitutional monarchy, very progressive, as Ron stated, the Hawaiian Kingdom's literacy was second to Scotland. Aboriginal Hawaiians throughout the islands received universal health care at no charge at Queen's Hospital and Kapiolani. Aboriginal Hawaiians could also purchase lands under the 1859 Kuleana Act at 50 cents an acre. In fact, by 1893, Aboriginal Hawaiians acquired over 167,000 acres of land in fee simple from the Hawaiian government. When people may hear about the Maheli and the dispossessed native Hawaiians, that's like the, 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 the story of the missionaries. It's all been rebuked by, by research that has been done uh, within, I would say, the last 20 years. The political economy of the Hawaiian kingdom was a form of cooperative capitalism based on morals and ethics. It stemmed from the political economy uh, from the economist named Francis Waylands from Brown University. In the 1864 Constitution, Article 1 says, God hath endowed all men with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the right of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property, and of pursuing and obtaining safety and happiness. And Article 13 says, the king conducts his government for the common good and not for the profit, honor, or private interests of any one man, family, or class of men among his subjects. This is what in political science 
we call as the, uh, the, the, the cornerstones of Hawaii's political economy, which was not capitalism as the United States understood it, which was uh, through Smith's uh, Wealth of Nation, as opposed to Hawaii, it was Francis Whalen's political economy, which is very similar to what we hear about in the Scandinavian countries today, Sweden, Norway, Finland, uh, of universal healthcare, right? Taking care of the people, uh, education. That was the kingdom that predated these Scandinavian countries, and this was in the 19th century. Between 1880 and 1892, 18 Hawaiian subjects participated in the Hawaiian Youths Abroad Program, where they studied in England, Scotland, Italy, United States, China, and Japan. In England, they attended King's College and St. Chad's College. Here's a picture of Joseph Kamau Oha at King's College. Subjects included military training, ironworks, medicine, engraving, politics, law, and sculpture. The founder of modern China, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, attended Iolani College and Punahou School in Honolulu from 1879 to 1883. 1910, when he was in Hawaii, he told a reporter, this is my Hawaii. Here I was brought up and educated, and it was here that I came to know what modern civilized governments are like and what they mean. Everything now will change. United States invasion of Hawaii and the overthrow of the Hawaiian government. Judge Greenwood from the International Court of Justice states, traditional international law, which would apply in the 19th century as it does today, was based upon a rigid distinction between the state of peace and the state of war. Countries were either in a state of peace or in a state of war. There was no middle ground or intermediate state. Acts of war is what triggers state of war. State of war includes belligerent occupation. By direction of Queen Lilikwakalani, President Cleveland, in March of 1893, initiated the investigation of the overthrow of the Hawaiian government on January 17th. Eleven months later, on December 18th, the president reported to the Congress his findings and conclusions of that presidential investigation. He stated to the Congress that on the 16th day of January, 1893, between four and five o'clock in the afternoon, a detachment of Marines from the United States steamer Boston with two pieces of artillery landed at Honolulu. The men upwards of 160 and all were supplied with double cartridges and with haversacks and canteens and were accompanied by a hospital corps with stretchers and medical supplies. The president concluded that the military demonstration upon the soil of Honolulu was of itself an act of war. International relations sees this as triggering a state of war. He also concluded that by an act of war with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States and without authority of Congress, the government of a feeble but friendly and confiding people has been overthrown. Now the use of his word feeble here is not derogatory. He's acknowledging that the Hawaiian kingdom is not a major power, right? It's actually a neutral state. And he also concludes and tells the Congress that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. These acts of war committed by the United States triggered a state of war with the Hawaiian kingdom. Under international law, the military overthrow of a country's government does equate to an overthrow of the country or what is called the state. According to Brownlee, after the defeat of Nazi Germany in the Second World War, the four major allied powers assumed supreme power in Germany. The legal competence of the German state, its independence and sovereignty, did not, however, disappear. What occurred is akin to legal representation or agency of necessity. The German state continued to exist, and indeed, the legal basis of the occupation depended on its existence. So in international law, there is a distinction between the state and the government. Sovereignty is in the state. Sovereignty is not in the government. Sovereignty in this case was in the Hawaiian state, internationally recognized since 1843. That authority or sovereignty was exercised by a Hawaiian kingdom government, which was monarchical, okay, very progressive. Well, that government was admitted to have been overthrown illegally by the United States by an invasion. By overthrowing the government, 
that did not equate to the overthrow of the state. And that is important, very important, to discern between the government and the state. Again, what was overthrown in 1893 was not the country. It was the government. Now, customary international law in 1893 obligated the United States as the occupier to administer the laws of the Hawaiian kingdom as the occupied and not the laws of the United States when, there, when the United States is in effective control of Hawaiian territory. That effective control in Hawaiian, ter in Hawaiian territory occurred on January 17th when the queen yielded her authority, that conditional surrender. This obligation of administering the laws of the occupied state is now codified under Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Regulations and Article 64 of the 1949 Fort Geneva Convention, which, by the way, applied during the first Gulf War when Saddam Hussein was occupying Kuwait. You did not administer Hawaiian Kingdom law and instead unilaterally annexed the Hawaiian Islands in 1898. So how does a state acquire the territory of another state under international law, and more importantly, you know, under the laws of war? Well, according to Oppenheim, cession of state territory is the transfer of sovereignty over state territory by the owner state to another state. And the only form in which a cession can be effected is an agreement embodied in a treaty between the ceding and the acquiring state. So here we have entities represented by their government, two sovereign states, right? One state will cede its territory to another, but, can it, but it can be done either in a state of peace or in a state of war, but you still need a treaty. Well, one way is to do it during a peacetime uh, uh, situation. Another situation would be ending the war, ending a state of war where treaty of cession will transfer territory to the victor, right? Now here's a map of the United States and the former 13 British colonies that became 13 independent states. They are located on the, on the East coast of the Americas, north of what we know today as Florida. How did the United States acquire all that territory to the West? Okay. Well, the first seeding of territory during, during a state of peace occurred in 1803. This was called the Louisiana Purchase. This was then followed up in 1819 from the Spanish, transferring what we know today as Florida. And then in 1846, the British transferred or ceded the British Northwest to the United States. Well, here, these, these territories were acquired during a state of peace. Now, territory north of the Rio Grande, which used to be Mexican territory, which we know today as California, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and so forth, well, that was transferred in 1848, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, that basically was a treaty of peace that terminated the state of war, returned it to a state of peace, but all Mexican territory north of the Rio Grande came now under American jurisdiction and authority. So what is the authority of Hawaii session? First thing is, is there a treaty? Well, it's actually what is called Joint Resolution Number 55, to provide for annexing the Hawaiian Islands to the United States. A joint resolution is a resolution agreed upon by both House and Senate and then signed into law by the U.S. President. The problem here is the joint resolution is a municipal law of the United States enacted by the Congress. This is no different than Saddam Hussein enacting a law in Baghdad proclaiming to have annexed Kuwait. The problem is United States law as a municipal law has no effect outside of its boundaries. It is limited to within its territory. A joint resolution is not a treaty. A treaty is under international law. And that is an agreement between two parties called two countries represented by their governments. In the country record, Senator William Allen of Nebraska, he clearly stated the limitation of US law when debates were going on regarding the uh, uh, joint resolution of annexation on July 4th, 1898. He stated the constitution and the statutes are territorial in their operation. That is, they cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the constitution and statutes cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property therein. 
two years later in 1900, when they were debating the Territorial Act, he came out and said flatly, the joint resolution is void. The U.S. Supreme Court in 1936 reiterated what Senator Allen already knew, and many of them did, and they were making their point on the record in the uh, records of the Congress. The U.S. Supreme Court said neither the Constitution nor the laws passed in pursuance of it have any force in foreign territory, and operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. The unilateral annexation of territory in a state of war is illegal, and it has no effect. This is why Saddam Hussein's unilateral annexation of Kuwait had no effect because it was still in a state of war. You need a treaty. According to Conan, for the laws of war continue to apply in occupied territory, even after the achievement of military victory, until either the occupant withdraws or a treaty of peace is concluded, which transfers sovereignty to the occupant. And according to Venturini, if an armed conflict occurs, the law of armed conflict must be applied from the beginning until the end when the law of peace resumes in full effect. Now, the territory by the United States and its proxies since January 17, 1893, did not extinguish the legal status of the Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state. Judge Crawford says, states, pending a final settlement of the conflict, belligerent occupation does not affect the continuity of the occupied state. The government authorities may be driven into exile or silence, and the exercise of the powers of the state thereby affected, but it is settled that the powers themselves continue to exist. This is strictly not an application of the actual independence rule that applies during a state of peace, but rather an exception to it, pending settlement of the conflict by a peace treaty or its equivalent. A joint resolution of annexation is not a treaty. In 1901, Queens Hospital was the first health institution to have been dismantled by the United States municipal laws. Queens Hospital was established in 1859 as the National Hospital for the Hawaiian Kingdom, and that healthcare services for Hawaiian subjects of Ab Aboriginal blood was at no charge. The Hawaiian head of state would serve as the ex officio president of the board, together with 20 trustees, 10 of whom were from the Hawaiian government. Since 1887, systematically dispossessed Aboriginal Hawaiians from their lands through foreclosures that did not go before the courts. Mortgage payments were intentionally increased to more than 100% where Aboriginal Hawaiians could not make the payment. This resulted in a systemic dispossession of lands by foreclosure that lasted until 1921. Prince Kuhil's Hawaiian Homes Act was a response to this dispossession. Why is it that we don't know this? What's well, denationalization? Samuel Damon, one of the insurgents in 1895 stated while he was a trustee of the Kamehameha schools, if we're ever to have peace and annexation, the first thing to do is to obliterate the past. Denationalization is defined under international law as a war crime, which is to obliterate the national consciousness of the occupied state. In 1919, denationalization was then listed as a war crime, titled Attempts to Denationalize the Inhabitants of Occupied Territory. Stemming from Italy's occupation in the Second World War, Yugoslav Charge 1434 stated, apart from killing, deporting, and interning innocent persons, the Italians started a policy on a vast scale of denationalization. As part of such policy, they started a system of re-education of Yugoslav children. This re-education consisted of forbidding children to use the Serbo-Croat language, to sing Yugoslav songs, and forcing them to salute in a fascist way. In 1906 began that formal policy of brainwashing that Kalania Kia covered before. The theme of the program was to indoctrinate the children of the Hawaiian Islands in all the schools, both public and private, to be American and to speak English. Harper's Weekly Magazine covered the story in, in going to Kaiolani Public School, Kahumanu Public School, and Honolulu High School before the name was changed in 1911 to William McKinley High School. In this picture, in Harper's Weekly, the caption has what the students are told to, to, to recite in unison at the command of the principal. 
We give our heads and our hearts to God and our country. One country, one language, one flag. This scene shows a salute to the American flag, which flies in the grounds of the Kaiolani Public School, which has many Japanese pupils. The drill is constantly held as a means of inculcating patriotism in the hearts of the children. The word inculcate is another word for brainwashing through repetition. As Dresden James, the British novelist once wrote, when a well-packaged web of lies has been sold gradually to the masses over generations, the truth will seem utterly preposterous and its speaker a raving lunatic. But the dam of ignorance begins to break. In 1988, the United States Department of Justice's Office of Legal Counsel questions Hawaii's annexation in 1898. They concluded it is therefore unclear which constitutional power Congress, of, Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by joint resolution. The acquisition of Hawaii can serve as an appropriate precedent for a congressional assertion of sovereignty over an extended territorial sea. In other words, if it was unclear how the United States Congress, which is limited to U.S. territory, can annex a foreign country, it would be equally unclear how the U.S. Congress could create a territorial government in 1900 and then rename that territorial government in 1959 as a state of Hawaii. Well, this is the real test. That history that I shared, that's called theory or explanation with the facts. We're now going to take this into practice. There's going to be a, now, a situation here where now it's going to be testing. Can the international community, including the United States, acknowledge that the Hawaiian kingdom continues to exist as an occupied state? Well, remember what was overthrown in 1893 was the government, not the country. So what happened in 1997 was the government was restored by a council of regency, which serves in the absence of a monarch, all under Hawaiian kingdom law. Addressing over a century of occupation, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was formed similar to the formation of governments in exile during the Second World War. In particular, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established in similar fashion to the Belgian Council of Regency after King Leopold was captured by the Nazis. As the Belgian Council of Regency was established under Article 82 of their Constitution of 1821, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established under Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution of 1864. The strategic plan of the council entailed three phases. First, verification that the Hawaiian kingdom still exists, but it has to be done by an outside body. Phase two, once that is secured, then expose that Hawaiian statehood within the framework of international law and the laws of occupation. Phase two will focus on truth and accountability. Phase three would be restoration of the Hawaiian government as an independent state. This is when the occupation comes to an end. In order to fulfill phase one, it occurred at the permanent court of arbitration in the Netherlands, in a case called Larsen versus the Hawaiian Kingdom from 1999 to 2001. The American Journal of International Law wrote of this international case, it stated, at the center of these proceedings was that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist and that the Council of Regency representing the Hawaiian Kingdom is legally responsible under international law for the protection of Hawaiian subjects, including the claimant, Lance Larson. In other words, the Hawaiian Kingdom was legally obligated to protect Larson from the United States' unlawful imposition of its municipal laws through its political subdivision, the state of Hawaii. As a result of this responsibility, Larson submitted that the Council of Regency should be liable for any international law violations that the United States had committed against them. Now, before they could even address this dispute, the Permanent Court of Arbitration had to determine whether or not the Hawaiian Kingdom still exists as a country, as a state, and that's what's important. So there are two primary jurisdictions at the Permanent Court of Arbitration, the institution, which is the jurisdiction of it, and the arbitral tribunal, which is the jurisdiction over the dispute. Prior to forming the tribunal, the PCA has to have what is called institutional jurisdiction. It speaks to the standing of the parties. Under Article 47 of the treaty that established the Permanent Court of Arbitration, it provides, states that the jurisdiction of the Permanent Court of Arbitration may, within the conditions laid down in the regulation, be extended to disputes with non-contracting states. What that means is countries that did not sign off on the treaty that formed the, formed the court. They're called non-contracting states. And they went ahead and they verified that Hawaii still exists as a state, and you will see it here. 
The Permanent Court of Arbitration is an intergovernmental organization that creates ad hoc tribunals to resolve disputes. They have juris uh, jurisdiction over certain disputes between two states. So here we have from the record of the court, a dispute between Ecuador and the United States of America. It is a state and the United States as a state. Both Ecuador and the United States are contracting states that help form the Permanent Court of Arbitration, therefore they can have access. You can all, they can also hear a dispute between a state and an international organization. And this was a dispute between Peru and the United Nations. They identified Peru as a state and the United Nations as an international organization. You could also hear a dispute between a state and a private party. And this is the Larson case, Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. The NF identified Larson as a private entity and the Hawaiian Kingdom a state. That is crucial. There we have just finished and accomplished phase one, verification of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state. And the United States is a member of this permanent court of arbitration as a contracting state. And they, along with 121 other countries, acknowledge that the Hawaiian Kingdom continues to exist. Then they were able to form the tribunal made up of these three arbitrators. Ms. Ninia Parks represented Lance Larson, and that's me, lead agent, representing the Hawaiian Kingdom and the Council of Regency. When we got back from the Netherlands, in closing, when we got back from the Netherlands, Think so? our job was to expose the occupation, remember, phase two. So we looked to the law of land warfare, okay? This is part of international law. It says remedies for violation of international law. In the event of violation of the law of war, the injured party, the Hawaiian Kingdom, may legally resort to remedial action of the following types. Publication of the facts with the view to influencing public opinion against the offending belligerent. What we needed to do was to re-enter the University of Hawaii and I will get my master's degree, my PhD, and I will engage that misinformation and disinformation head on. So consequences of one year of war. First, no free healthcare at Queens Hospital. Our people are suffering. No purchasing of lands in fee simple from the Hawaiian government at $17 an acre, according to the inflation calculator of 50 cents in 1850. Remember that those laws still exist. Aboriginal Hawaiians are the highest incarcerated population. American population exploded from 1,928 in 1890 to a staggering 293,379 by 1950. Aboriginal Hawaiians were the majority of the national population before 1893 under Hawaiian law, but today they are the minority under American law. And also finally, this is the ultimate problem of why the occupation needs to come to an end and the world needs to know that we are illegally occupied. Hawaii is targeted for nuclear strike by North Korea, China, and Russia because of US military bases. Uh, why do I? It's not showing, there we go. Okay. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to uh, the people of AHEC. Mahalo. Mahalo nui e uh, Dr. Keanu Sai, um, Dr. Ronald Williams, um, Kahu Popham, uh, Jocelyn, uh, Mahalo Antipualani, Mahalo Kahu Ron, and Mahalo uh, Papa Makua. You've all done a wonderful and great job tonight. And um, I'd like to thank you, Mahalo. Mia oko pakahi apao no ko oko hananui. Um, Laurie, do we still have um, time available for participants to ask questions? Um, there, there's a couple of questions still in the Q and A. Um, I'm wondering if you could just do two more and then um, wrap it up. Okay. okay. Uh, Go ahead, can you share one of them for our um, experts? Sure, I'm going to ask Dorothy and Julie if they could um, read one or two of the questions in the Q&A. Okay. Um, 
Okay. Um, I'm a little confused because they're being answered as, <laughs> as we're looking at them. One question is, in what ways have AHEC and have the 60 overthrow era Hawaiian churches who received the $2.5 million followed up on the Synod resolutions and the HCUCC redress? Uh, Kahu Ron, I think you best fit the response for this question. I'm not sure if the question is basically about the Hawaii Conference uh, redress package, but uh, the that was done in uh, 1966. But it had three main portions, right? Uh, One and a half million dollars given to the churches in existence at the time of the overthrow and still uh, existing today. It had one million given to the HEC uh, that uh, became its uh, uh, five E's uh, uh, redress money uh, that they gave out, and one million dollars that was given to Pua Foundation together with land, and that was supposed to be for the uh, um, to the outside of the church to Nakanakamali. So I think uh, we need to go to the three bodies and ask them. I think there's no follow up. Uh, uh, organization that followed up on that redress package. If there's anything, maybe it might be the reconciliation committee of the Hawaii conference that may be following up on that and checking up, you know, from the Pua Foundation, what they've done, HEC, what they've done with the $1 million, and then uh, naming all of the churches that got the redress money. I don't think anyone expected them to give a, a response because they were the recipients, but I'm not sure, you know, if what the intent of the question is, but anyway, that's my uh, uh, brief uh, response. And, and I think to fully understand um, the question and the situation, um, over the past 30 years, a tremendous amount of research has occurred in the, um, uh, the situation that had occurred from 1893. So it's basically changing the whole dynamic of how we should move forward uh, properly. So without the information uh, mm. from the 1993 um, apology, it, it, it resulted in a very different uh, outcome. But moving forward, um, Okay, this is the truth. This is the factual truth supported by international bodies and legal um, associations. Uh, one more question. Is that Jocelyn with your hand up? Aloha, I just wanted to add that um, that is a really good question because it, um, it was a question that was brought to all of our paiainas and as well as in our association as to um, some type of um, evaluation on that reparation and um, reconciliation. And so after 10 years of request, we've now been in about two years worth of um, dialogue to start to unravel and understand what this reconciliation and apology was supposed to produce when there was no um, real evaluation from the time of the apology until now. So that is also what the church is working on. So Malu for the question. And um, one last question. Uh, why is this AHEC resolution focused on urging federal and civil governments to begin to comply with international humanitarian law and its prolonged and illegal occupation of the Hawaiian islands instead of anything to do with calling the church to study the newly available. Thank you, Ron. History and acknowledge the roles of the son of missions. Repent of the racism inherent in the overthrow of the monarchy and engage actively with current native Hawaiians as partners and allies instead of from an attitude of supremacy. Is this what all the, is this all the native Hawaiians in AHEC wanna ask of the UCC churches? So it's a question of 
whether <clears throat> there sh should be a question to the churches rather than the governments, I believe. A oh, mahalo, great question. Absolutely. Um, every church should replay this video, um, try their best to understand the legal, political, and uh, our Christian morals, values, and obligations that we all have uh, for justice from 128 years of injustice. And, um, you know, for me anyway, each church should begin to reconcile that within your church membership and later um, branch out to brother, sister churches. And hopefully the HCUCC will um, provide some leadership and direction. And mahalo to the AHEC uh, committee uh, presenters who did a fabulous job um, tonight bringing all of this information and history forward um, that hasn't been um, aligned in a way that, at least for me, is uh, digestible. But at the same time, it was a tremendous amount of uh, research and information. And um, in order to understand this, we all need to start to study, um, read the Royal Commission of Inquiry, um, go and read uh, Dr. Ron Williams' uh, dissertation. I, I think that's the first step, um, is trying your best to understand um, our situation uh, in the past and peeling away the Americanization, the indoctrination, the inculcation and brainwash um, that um, influences um, all of our decisions uh, today. And, and um, I'd like to leave it at that uh, for tonight and just mahalo each and every one of you for attending. And if we can have uh, Papa Makua um, close us off with a pule, I think that will be a great night, uh, two hours and 10 minutes. Awesome. Thank you, Juan. And once again, and uh, mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight and to our um, committee, mahalo also as well. Let's end with prayer as we can together. Ipulikako, the gracious God of mercy and aloha, dismiss us with, with your love and uh, rekindle, God, in our hearts, our unity in Christ. And ask your blessings upon all that have been here tonight, as well as those who receive uh, the gifting of this knowledge, but also the understanding and also the blessing that you've given us through your grace, Father. We pray that blessings will be upon all of us together as we walk together hand in hand uh, with you, Lord, as you hold our hand to journey forward. And thank you, God, for this evening of this time to spend together uh, with one another. Bless us now, we pray, God, in the name of Jesus, I pray. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, blessings be upon you all. Amen. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again. Mahalo again to all. Amen and mahalo.